Okay, I think we need we need to continue. So this is uh, a great pleasure for me to um, move on to the next session, which is the IC Permed Best Practice in Personalized Medicine Recognition in 2019. And some of you who have not attending our previous workshops and meetings on may ask yourselves, what is this? And uh, it is really a very good example of bringing together the different stakeholders and member states and to recognize the best practice examples in personalized medicine. It gives, first of all, an opportunity to honor, but also to promote and disseminate good examples. And we really emphasize this as one of a very one of our key message or functions that we have to emphasize and to lift good examples of implementation out there somewhere at the university hospital or at the university in a region, in a country. Uh, we also think that it makes a difference and it fosters others to bring forward their examples. And that's why we have this award and to encourage others to follow. So it is a small instrument, but it's extremely valuable and gives the possibility of large impact of implementation of personalized medicine. But I am not going to be in charge of this. This is uh, uh, one of the members of the executive committee of ICPMED, and that's Gaetano Guglielmi from the um, from Ministry of Health of Italy. Please, Gaetano. Uh. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. This uh, is the second edition of the best practice in personal medicine. In, uh, in EC Permed, we identified that it is uh, necessary to identify some best practice in personal medicine to support, to push the capacity of the, uh, of, the personal, of the research in personal medicine. I'm working with this, my team and that uh, is working very hard for this activity. This is the second. We launched the second call in November 2018 with the submission in February 2019 and uh, about some outdoor uh, applicants from any country and candidate proposal published and developed between 1st January uh, 2017 30 October 2018 is eligible. Call topics is based on lineage for this meeting today, the, and the winner is invited today. In addition, the successful candidate will receive a cash, little cash support, only is not relevant, but the capacity of our budget is limited, that is invited here, and uh, receive a value a cash of 500 euros, like a representative of this. Main topics. Uh, the application that received is divided in three different topics. Scientific paper focus and or novel approach for the implementation of personal medicine. This because in personal medicine is a very large uh, field of activity in different expertise area of the research. The problem of the training program for help personal increasing the level of awareness of the potential of personal medicine. When the Europe, the European Union, uh, create. Uh, perform the first conference in Brussels on personal medicine, this is one of the relevant of the training is one of the relevant aspect because it's necessary to have a correct management of the, of the capacity of the new therapy in personal medicine. Example for interdisciplinary intersectoral group of collaboration, governmental, non-governmental, academic, and so on, for the implementation of personal medi medicine, including ethical, legal, and social issue. And this is because personal medicine is not only a problem of uh, drugs, like uh, therapy to give, but it's a very complicated approach on an aspect that recruit uh, in order of legal and ethical and social aspect to take in consideration in our national health system. This is uh, EC, the overview. This is, uh, we receive a number of uh, 38 applications. Uh, in two different states, 
in January and the second second deadline in for February. This is a national distribution from the different country. Uh, Italy perform uh, uh, 30, but all the other country like uh, Turkey, Israel, Germany, Austria receive uh, four applications, and there are other countries that distribute it in Europe. And uh, the, 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 it's relevant that the gender distribution, the female, is, a re is more relevant than the male normally. In, uh, in Italy, this is not the situation, but it's a, correct ba ba it's a correct balance in the gender distribution. This is a type of applicant group that uh, we have. So the more relevant is medical educational professional, following research professional, and healthcare professional. And there are also representative patient organization and of the employee by private industry. And this is a distribution of the select on area. The more relevant is scientific paper on novel approach. The following the example for interdisciplinary intersectoral group of collaboration. And there is a little group of uh, application that is a mix of this uh, three different uh, uh, sector. Uh, the main topics area is a representation of the actual situation of the personal medicine. We have cancer area is uh, more relevant because just now is uh, is uh, more relevant, but uh, we have a, a relevant activity or other area like chronic disease area, neurological, pediatric, and so on, research area. This is uh, relevant for our EC permit because in a permit there is a, in personal medicine there is a spread, a big spread between the different area, and the different area is in the different level of the research. We need to take in consideration also for the future to improve some other area than other. And uh, we uh, contact 31 experts for the evaluation, and uh, we receive negative up for four projects. For 12, 12 uh, no answer. At the end, we have uh, 12 col final collaboration. This is a distribution in the name of the, our reviewer in different area, bioinformatic, cardiovascular, pharmacogenomic, biosense, immunodescent uh, disease, clinical innovation, genomics, clinical oncology, biomedical informatic, global health, patient association, and genomic oncology. This is a review that represents a, 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 a good mix of the different expertise. Uh, we perform a one-stage project and is supported by Secretariat that is per, by, by EC Permit Secretariat for the final decision. It's performed the activity by um, my, my administration and uh, in connection with the steering board as a responsibility. And uh, the evaluation criteria, knowledge production, research capacity building and targeting, informing policy and practice, population, health, and health sector, economic impact. And in line with the score that normally is gate is offer is one to five as a mark with the threshold uh, more than two. This is uh, the certificate, a little paper. <laughs> uh, it's not, a, but is a, a formal significant. And the selected proposal is a fourth selected proposal. Today, we are free people that is present here and present the result and a, a short description of the activity. First, Patrizio Giacomini, that from the National Cancer Institute of Rome on the liquid biopsy. Second, uh, Jürgen Busch from Austria and uh, some best open innovation in St. Pratic for the establishment. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and this is a, a co-sharing activity with other author in the other can, or the other university. Uh, Sulat Resimberg from Estonia on translating genotype data into clinical pharmacogenomic, and uh, Mark Rubin that in the, from Switzerland. Then Rubin, unfortunately, is not can here, and uh, is, I don't know if possible. Uh, we have a, a, a recording of, a, of the presentation on developing an integration organized model in personal medicine platform. And this is uh, the, diff, the presentation, the short presentation of everyone. I have a very short uh, uh, of the uh, CV of the every people that after my presentation, I uh, have a f short five minutes to present uh, the uh, different uh, uh, applications. So this is Patricio Giacomini, Jürgen Busch, 
is the director of the health science of, uh, of the institution of Vienna and uh, implementing for digital health and personal medicine strategy at Ludwig Boltzmann uh, Institution. And this is uh, Sulver Reisberg, he is a PhD student in bioinformatics in the University of Tartu and is a working experience on the health databases. And this is Mark Rubin, is a leader on field on prostate cancer biology and precision medicine. But we are selected also other uh, researcher that have a good result and we offer the opportunity to present the poster in, uh, during uh, today and this is a different representation of the different uh, select proposal for the section of poster. And, uh, but this is the second step now just running the, the third step, the EC Permet Recognition 2020. We launched it yesterday. The deadline for the permission is the 23rd of January 2020. According the applicant is open a worldwide. Uh, and the call topic has been aligned to the topic Paris Conference, Health System Enabling Personalized and Valuable Health Promotion, Prevention, Diagnosis and Treatment. And uh, obviously this is a timetable. So we launch, uh, we perform a, pre a preliminary announcement in October. In the uh, yesterday we launched the call, the deadline in January. Uh, we planning to hand in March the deadline of the evaluation and the selection and communication in April. And in October 2020, during the CPERMED conference in Paris, we have a new presentation like, to, like similar to this. And uh, for every question, <coughs> In order to the next school, please contact my colleagues, Maria Grazia Mancini and Maria Josefina Ruiz Alvarez, that I thank for the hard work that performed for this activity. Now, I ask to the first, for the first uh, presentation, I ask to Patrizio Giacomini to come here for the presentation of the. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, thank you for the very nice introduction, Dr. Guglielmi. Uh, let me say, let me say outright that uh, at the Regional Institute in Italy, we don't want to do something that will become useful tomorrow. We want to do something that's useful today. And uh, so all our approaches are strongly based on uh, uh, real life oncology. Uh, in particular, liquid biopsy, we, we want to run a very small aim clinical trials addressing very specific questions, trying to, to, to look for information that can be very useful, it can be applied to each person, to each single patient. And uh, uh, so standard of care, of course, that's the key word, the take home message. Um, I'll show you just one example in the interest of time. It's a, a small clinical trials we like very much on patients that have been treated with uh, trastuzumab emtansin, TDM1, RB2 uh, breast cancer, uh, actionable uh, um, uh, CTDNA signatures that come out of the study and I refer to the molecular tumor board. And I will open up a little bit of, of uh, the, the, there will be a few slides about nanophotonics in liquid biopsy. Then I will move beyond the standard of care since we touched upon the molecular tumor board. And I will show you how nanotechnologies can be used to develop uh, a kind of a, an improvement of the antibody drug conjugate uh, uh, system. Uh, two of them, actually. One is the toolbox system, the other one are nanoferritins, and how this can be moved into uh, uh, antibody that uh, drive drugs onto cancer cells. And then hopefully looping back and closing the circle into the standard of care. So liquid biopsy is the first topic. So uh, let me draw your attention on the lower left side of the, of the slide. And you can see that there are four patients. This is a multicentric trial. And uh, you can see that here 
you have uh, an example of a trajectory, uh, uh, cancer alteration that goes up in blood in the second patient. It stays down until there is a raise, then a sudden raise very late, and then two different mutations that intersect one with the other. So it's very simple. I mean, liquid biopsy speaks a very natural language, very simple things. But these are clonal dissections of what's going on in the patients. So you that you can easily assign primary, adaptive, and different types of responses. And at the end of TDM1, and you know that TDM1 is a treatment that's been given as the last uh, option to patients who have a long history of RB2 blockade. RB2 is a strong cancer driver. And let me, let me show you that uh, you have mutations at the beginning of treatment. You have mutations, these are different, at the end of treatment, after a few months under therapeutic pressure. And the only cases, the only two cases, this is a preliminary uh, glimpse at the data based on the first patients that we enrolled. The only patients that we do not see a mutations at the end of, of treatment are two patients who develop brain metastasis. And uh, if you copy paste and you classify the mutations at the end of treatment based on Onco-KB levels, you realize that five out of eight patients do have a novel mutations that was not present at the beginning, and it's actionable. So there is space for additional lines of therapy. So tumor vulnerabilities that are not present are seen in blood, only in blood, not in tissues. So we are now referring to the molecular tumor board for treatment, these patients, and we have the initial results. So we were encouraged, and this is, these are the results of a, a large multicenter study conducted with the strong support of the European Union. And was led, it was led by Giuseppe Spoto, my dear friend in Catania. And uh, uh, nanophotonics is great when it comes to liquid biopsy because you do not need PCR to generate pieces, chunks of DNA. So it's immaterial, so light. You just need light. It goes on very quickly. You see the mutations in real time and blah, blah, blah. I have no time to go through, but the, 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 the tangible, sorry, the tangible result of this is that we have developed the first and so far the only nanophotonic prototype for liquid biopsy that matches the sensitivity of digital PCR. And we have other nanophotonic platforms at work at the Virginia Institute in collaboration with, for instance, other groups uh, working in the room area like and with, with, uh, for the for RB2 dosage. So when you design objects for diagnosis and uh, therapy on the nanoscale, you have freedom to design. So you can make modules, you can make a piece of the object that is designed independently of the others. Let me give you an example. So this is toolbox, RB2 cancer cells, an antibody to RB2. The antibody is modified by a specific tag that binds a special adapter that binds the tag 10 to the minus 18 affinity, 1,000 times more than the highest known biological affinity in the real world, in nature. and. Another uh, 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 the, 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 the streptactin bridges the antibody with uh, with the drug, and also it can be used to bridge other special molecules that are HLA molecules loaded with a single viral peptide, so that the immune system is led to believe is cheated. It is led to believe that tumor cells are infected with flu. And of course, flu is an antigen that we are all uh, uh, very highly immunized, especially you now at the beginning of uh, fall. Uh, and uh, so I like to see toolbox as something halfway between an ADC, an antibody drug conjugate, and a, a TCAR. 
another system is ferritin. Ferritin is also in the nano range. And ferritin is, of course, as you all know, it carries iron all around the body. But you can replace iron if you produce it in recombinant form with whatever cytotoxics that you like, not whatever, but many. Many, and uh, ferritin is a natural uh, protein that goes through blood-brain barrier. Uh, 24 subunits, but in the case of our recombinant uh, uh, ferritin, we replace the beta subunits with the alpha subunits. Uh, it's very stable. Uh, and on a molar basis, it entraps many more molecules than any antibody drug conjugate can be, up to 200 molecules per uh, uh, particle, per nanoparticle. And cancer cells are iron hungry, so they pick up, they uptake ferritin, and they commit suicide. It's, uh, we, we plan to go with this into phase one clinical trial, first quarter 2021. We are going through the regulatory process, but the, the innovative industrial process is quite solid, it appears to be quite solid. Wide spectrum of caging, wide spectrum of potential tumor target, protein, uh, so, sorry, uh, pharmacokinetics uh, that are exceptionally favorable because ferritin that is usually clear from the circulation in, within minutes stays there for hours, recirculating the drug all over and over. And therapeutic effic efficacy, that's extremely encouraging. Then we can modify with antibodies to improve the flexibility of the system, both by chemical and recombinant DNA methods. So let me conclude. Um, so we want to integrate uh, all these nanotechnologies that I've been going through. And let's imagine the case of uh, a cancer that has two ways to elude, like TDM1 therapy, for instance, like our patients. That, do you remember that the, the, the small clinical trial we were running at the beginning? So either they lose the target antigens or they lose sensitivity to the drug. So let's imagine that we treat our patients. Uh, we have planned to recruit 45 of them with um, uh, TDM1. TDM1 gets rid of the major population, but there, is, there are still RB2 expressing cells that can be can acquire, uh, um, that are, ca can be killed using, for instance, toolbox and using a different drug to which the first set of cells were insensitive. Of course, we know that clonal selection is going on. We know it because of the work of many groups, including the liquid biopsy data that I've shown you at the beginning. And then we may resort to a different target, CD71, we can use uh, nanoferritin, and so forth, we can further modify. So what, what I'm trying to, to say is that, of course, I'm not sure this will become true. I'm not selling this as something that we are the only ones who are doing or something that is the next standard of therapy. But I believe that we should give it a thought to nanotechnology and to modular design of drugs because this will be possibly useful in the future. And let me add another little piece of evidence that not only we have combination targeting and combination dragging by this modular system, but we may also uh, guide the administration of these new drugs using liquid biopsy. Just imagine that, for instance, in this, at, at, the, at an early stage, detecting uh, um, vulnerability in the tumor, uh, may lead to the assignment of a therapy that can be more effectively dispatched by uh, a nanosystem, and also at late stages the same, so that in the end, combination targeting and combination dragging can be driven by liquid biopsy. And this is modular personalized medicine, in my personal view. Uh, nothing that I have shown you would have been possible without the strong support by the academia, the, in, some industrial partners. Uh, we had, of course, the non-profit support in this uh, venue. I want to underline that I have had inter uninterrupted support by the European Union over the past five, six years. 
And if you want to know more, there are recent patents issued on the, uh, on the technologies that I have shown you. And I was asked by Maria Grazia Mancini, whom I uh, thank very much for the assistance in preparing this presentation, to, to tell all of you what we will do with the uh, prize awarded by IC Permed. Let me thank the, the board. Let me thank everybody for being here. So this is just an idea. We can build it together. But I hope that in Rome, uh, uh, in 2020, we can have uh, a uh, precision oncology open day. Uh, this will be co-supported by our institution, beside by the prize that was already granted by IC Permed. And you can read what, uh, I mean, a draft of what the agenda of this meeting could be. But I want to draw your attention on the very last these duet talks. We have several patients who have been seen at the molecular tumor board, and they have had dramatic responses to off-label therapy. And uh, I already had uh, uh, contacted them, and they are willing to talk to uh, on behalf of European citizens about the success of precision medicine. And I believe this, this is open to all of you. So, while I thank everybody for inviting me here for the prestigious prize, for the nice introductions, for the pleasure of being together here in Madrid, let me say, well, let's meet, let's gather all together in Rome in a few months from now, and let's see what the progress will be, and I hope that there will be many contributions, and this will make this Rome Open Day a very successful event. Thank you. Now, after the presentation of Dr. Giacomini, we have a new pre another presentation in the other total different sectors or interdisciplinary activity. And I ask to Dr. Jürgen Busch to come to the floor, to have the floor for the presentation from Austria. Hello to everybody. Thank you very much to the chair for choosing us for the Recognition Award 2019. Many thanks also to Maria Gracia and Katerina, Christina for, for supporting me uh, and my uh, participation in this event. Uh, and also many thanks to the co-authors and co-owners of these initiatives, my colleagues at Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, Gesellschaft, uh, Lucia Malfent, the former director of our Open Innovation in Science Center, Professor Josef Niebauer, Professor Harald Wilschke, who will be responsible for the implementation side when it comes to the implementation of the research that has been developed through our Open Innovation in Science uh, process throughout the last almost two years now, and Gertrud Leimüller from Winnovation, our consultant uh, who helped us in developing the process I'm going to introduce to you. Uh, so we attempted to establish interdisciplinary and intersectoral collaboration platforms for the implementation of personalized medicines through open innovation in science. Uh, so uh, an exercise in, 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 in the sense of, of the interface units that are also mentioned in the outline for workshop uh, for today. Uh, this is a kind of this is the kind of institutional background of the Ludwig Boltzmann uh, Society and our our uh, initiatives in the domain of, of personal mes personalized medicine and digital health. Uh, in 2014-15, we uh, founded an Open Innovation in Science Center at our institution and organization. Uh, that piloted and, and developed uh, crowdsourcing uh, activities, speech to partner activities, lead user, lead expert workshop formats, sand pits, ideas lab formats, uh, and did research in uh, institutional organizational design for such collaboration platforms in the form of Ludwig Boltzmann Institutes. Uh, we generally uh, found and, and run uh, research, translational research institutes, mainly in the domain of, of medicine, life sciences, but also in social sciences and humanities. We operate 20 institutes, uh, and the last four new institutes we founded 
are all in, in one way or another related to personal med medicine. This was the case uh, in 2016 when a rare and undiagnosed disease institute and an applied diagnostic institute was founded. And this is the case with these new initiatives of, of another two new Boltzmann institutes uh, in, in that area. Um, our institutes are kind of particular public-private uh, funding uh, initiatives. Uh, we, thanks to grants we applied for competitively and received from the Austrian National Endowment for RTD, uh, we are able to co-fund um, our institutes by 60% and other 40% are co-financed by collaborative uh, intersectoral partner institutions. And this allows us for this new initiative to fund two new institutes uh, related and uh, doing research and translational activities in the domains of digital health and personalized medicine with 10 million euros each for a funding period of seven years. Uh, we, thanks to these grants from the National Endowment, the Spolzman Society, uh, are able to contribute with two times six million euros for these two new institutes. Uh, and in order to found those institutes, we developed a competitive four-stage open innovation in science process for the spending and distribution of these funds. And here you can see a kind of uh, overview of this four-phase uh, process. Um, so in the first phase, uh, we made use of uh, the format of expert and stakeholder crowdsourcing uh, in order to identify potential areas combining digital health and personalized medicine being of strategic uh, importance uh, for the Austrian research and the European research landscape. Uh, in a second phase, uh, we, uh, through a pitch to partner process, we identified and uh, selected uh, co-organizing, co-financing -finan partner consortia. In a third phase, uh, together with uh, or through uh, and, and lead user and lead expert workshop involving uh, a couple of international lead users and lead experts in, in the relevant domains. Uh, we developed research questions that were then put on call for an ideas lab or sand pit where throughout one week uh, competitively chosen applicants uh, had the opportunity to form uh, research teams, teams of principal investigators and international co-investigators and put forward uh, and pitch their, their research concepts that were then by an international jury of mentors guiding this ideas lab competitively chosen. And they had the opportunity to develop in the aftermath of the ideas lab uh, to develop research plans that were again uh, subjected to, to uh, international review. And by, by, by this summer, these two groups received uh, the approval by the Boltzmann Society that they will receive the funding. And by 1st of October of this year, these new, two new in research institutes started uh, to be operative. So when it comes to the first phase, uh, the challenge was to identify uh, current societal needs in the health sector in combination with the application of open innovation and science tools and research methods to support, complement, and therefore enrich research in digital health and personalized medicine. So the particular connex here was uh, the use of, of digital tools and, and data uh, for personalized medicine re, uh, endeavors. Uh, in this process, 190 persons uh, have been contacted, 62 semi-structured interviews have been carried out, 42 secondary resources uh, have been analyzed. And this led to five thematic, potential thematic areas that were proposed to an international jury uh, that made the selection you can see on the left. Uh, and their choice was to combine the overaching topic of transforming health systems into a patient-centered world. Uh, with specific aspects of increasing the contribution of patients to diagnosis, treatments, and aftercare as topic one, and the same overarching topic of transforming health systems into a patient-centered world uh, combined with specific aspects of securing and enhancing, enhancing the quality of health service and patient safety as topic two. 
once these two areas have been selected and defined, uh, we organized roadshows and uh, contacted uh, several Austrian stakeholders in order to select and, and uh, raise interest uh, for partners and host organizations that were willing to, to co-finance uh, two new Boltzmann Institutes and to host these two new institutes. And the outcome of this phase was that uh, for topic one, in a more explorative sense, uh, a regional collaboration of the university hospital in, in Salzburg, also involving the, the government of the province of Salzburg, the university there, the University of Applied Sciences there, uh, and the Austrian Institute of Technology. In, in the case of the second topic, in a more exploitative uh, sense, a, a collaboration, a consortium was formed involving the Medical University of Vienna, Caritas, a, a social care institution, Philips, Beckton Dickinson, the city of Vienna, the Lower Austrian Hospital Facility Holding, and the Austrian Platform for Patient Safety as main co-financing partner organizations. Together with this consortia, in, in phase three, a lead user, lead expert workshop was organized uh, together uh, or involving 16 international lead users and experts in September 2018, uh, selected out of, of again, uh, 86 persons that have been contacted for that purpose. Also users and unusual idea givers out of uh, target markets, analogous markets. Uh, and their task was to define a set of research questions that was then put on call uh, for the ideas lab. And the overaching lead research questions, this uh, group of, of, of experts and, and, and users came up with for topic one with the lead research question of how to support positive health behavior for cardiovascular disease patients in a sustainable way. And for topic two, in the domain of patient safety, how to provide digital solutions in health ecosystems. It asks patients, families, and providers to deal with patient safety issues and health literacy in a patient-centric way. So together with a whole set of a bundle of, of research questions under the, the heading of these lead research questions. Uh, a call for an ideas lab that was organized in February uh, 2019 was uh, put on call internationally. We received 174 applications from 30 different countries, 31 candidates for principal investigator and co-investigator positions on call were selected by a different new international mentor jury consisting of seven persons. Uh, and the outcome of this ideas lab was the selection of, of two PI and co-I teams for both locations uh, where these new institutes are implemented for topic one and Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Digital Health and Prevention in Salzburg under the responsibility of the <coughs> scientific director, prof <coughs> sorry, Professor Niebauer, an international team consisting of researchers out of uh, several interdisciplinary domains, Radha Hussein, an Egyptian uh, researcher working in the United St States, Dino Kulnik from the United Kingdom, Thomas Stütz from Austria, uh, Rick Cruz and Dieter Hein, Machti Shareban as co eyes and for the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute in Digital Health and Patient Safety in Vienna, another team consisting of three PIs <coughs> and four international, partly international co eyes as well. Once these teams, research teams, have been selected on the basis of, of their proposal, they pitched in front of the international jury on the last day of the Ideas Lab. Uh, they then had the opportunity through from March until uh, summer 2019 to, on the basis of the concepts that were chosen in the Ideas Lab, to develop a full research plan for seven years. And after another international external review, these two research plans have been approved and selected and here, finally, you see a very short uh, uh, summary of the missions of these two selected initiatives. 
For Salzburg, their objective of the research program is to provide personalized, long-term, sustainable, efficient, and effective support to patients for health-promoting behavior change in order to reduce the risk and consequences of cardiovascular diseases. In the case of Vienna, the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute will address patient safety and health literacy in a pervasively digitalized environment, dealing specifically and comprehensively with questions of application of data science, data ownership, patient and uh, healthcare professionals, empowerment, related legal frameworks, related necessary education and training programs for healthcare professionals, and uncertainty in data use in a personalized patient-centric way. As I have said, uh, after signing all the co-financing contracts and partner contracts with, with the co-financing uh, partners and the host organizations, being the Medical University of Vienna and being the University Hospital in Salzburg, uh, from 1st of October of this, year's, uh, of this year, these two institutes that function as interdisciplinary and transsectoral collaboration platforms for the implementation of this kind of research missions started to be operative. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, and now uh, the third uh, winner, uh, Mr. Suleb Reisberg, uh, coming from Estonia, is uh, an informatic expert. And please, yeah, you are the floor. Good morning. Um, my name is Sulav Reisberg. I'm uh, a, research, a research fellow of health informatics uh, at the University of Tartu in Estonia. And uh, I'm going to talk about a uh, recent publication uh, about personal pharmacogenetic uh, recommendations, and particularly about uh, how we developed an algorithm uh, to select those recommendations for a large, large uh, set of people in Estonian uh, biobank. Is this uh, pointer? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. now it's it. Thanks. Um, you know that uh, in the DNA there are regions called genes, and within genes there are regions um, called uh, exons, all together uh, called exome which carry the information of how the proteins of the entire body are produced. And those um, proteins, including enzymes, uh, uh, determine uh, basically uh, the, the how we look like, and, but they also transport the materials within the body. They protect against foreign substances and, and so forth. And basically, uh, those... Um, um, enzymes play also an important part of how we respond to the medical drugs. Um, several um, drugs get activated by certain enzymes in our liver. And if those enzymes work well, and we all take our pills regularly with the intended intervals, um, then the drug concentration in blood stays in the right therapeutic window. However, uh, if we have a genetic mutations in those genes that encode those enzymes, then the enzymes might become uh, non-functional. And as a result, the drug does not uh, get activated. It is not metabolized from our uh, bodies as intended. And um, the increasing uh, amount of substance in our uh, blood uh, may cause uh, several side effects, uh, toxicity, uh, and, and so forth. Also, the opposite is possible. Some people may have uh, high quantities of those enzymes, leading to, leading to so-called rapid metabolism, um, which means that um, uh, if those people take the pills with the same uh, normal uh, intervals, uh, the, 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 they are not getting the sufficient effect from the drug, and they also might suffer from uh, several side effects. 
The good thing is that for several um, genes, it is already known which genetic variants cause the uh, pharmaco uh, pharmaco functional changes in those genes. And on the other hand, there are more than 100 drugs already available that have the information given in their leaflets how the pharmacogenetic phenotype should be taken into account when adjusting the dosage uh, for the, for the patient, patients. Now, the problem is uh, perhaps more in the left side of the screen. Uh, there are several genetic tests already available to detect the, the pharmacogenetic phenotype from the, from the sample of the patient. But these tests are quite limited. Uh, they are only targeting single genes and few uh, genetic markers. But we wanted to uh, mm, do the testing uh, more comprehensively. And we turned the um, existing knowledge of 11 pharmaco, uh, clinically important pharmacogenes into computer algorithms and predicted the um, pharmacogenetic phenotype for, uh, for 44,000 participants in Estonian Biobank. Before I show you the results, there is one uh, more thing uh, to, to consider. Um, as you know, there are several techniques to turn the biological DNA into digital, digital format. The whole genome sequencing uh, detects the entire uh, genome of the patient. The exome sequencing uh, detects only the encoding part, the exome. And the genotyping arrays, um, the cheapest option here, uh, detects only certain markers uh, in the genome. But usually it detects, detects the variants that vary the most and allows predicting all the intermediate variants uh, uh, between them through the process called uh, imputation. And now the question for us was that, does it matter which technique to use for uh, pharmacogenetic testing? Can we go on with genotyping arrays, or should we look towards exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing instead? So we wanted to test it out. And here is the illustration of our analysis and our algorithm. Uh, it takes in some... Um, uh, whole genome sequencing data and whole exome sequencing data. But in addition, we used uh, data from two genotyping arrays, the green one and the yellow one here, the GSA and Omni uh, genotyping arrays. And then the process goes through several steps. And for each sample, it goes through the decision tree. <coughs> and as a result, it detects the pharmacogenetic phenotype for each uh, sample. Here you can see the results. Um, um, you can see here the pro pro proportion of the uh, participants in Estonia Biobank who need a dosage uh, adjustment for each gene and for each genotyping uh, technique. And if you look at the, the red one here, uh, we showed that uh, the exome sequences are not um, sufficient for pharmacogenetic testing because several uh, important uh, genetic variants are outside the exome region. However, using a genotyping arrays uh, together with imputation, the green, the yellow one, they provide quite uh, comparable uh, results to the much more expensive uh, whole genome sequencing. <clears throat> and uh, therefore, we think that using Genotyping arrays is a reasonable option for large uh, scale of the implementation of uh, pharmacogenetic testing. And when taking all genes together, it turned out that 99.8% per, per of the PowerPoint participants need a dosage adjustment in at least one uh, drug. And 5% of those uh, patients used any of these drugs in, on a daily basis which emphasizes for us, uh, or for everyone, uh, the importance of taking this kind of testing into, into uh, routine uh, care. Uh, we are providing um, personal genetic counseling for, for uh, gene donors in our biobank already, 
And here you can uh, see an example of the, of the report. And part of this uh, report is a so-called pharmacogenetic report. Uh, on the right, you can see the list of um, medications. And with green and yellow uh, icons, and sometimes green icons, uh, there's an indication whether the patient has a normal metabolism of this drug or something that is different from the normal. And in addition to the report to the, for the patient, we also have more detailed overview uh, for the doctor <coughs> with exact uh, recommendations uh, what to do with this like um, uh, finding, whether to use a normal dose or, or whether to, to adjust it. And um, this study has had an impact already. Uh, we, in Estonia, we have started uh, a national project to build a national IT infrastructure to provide pharmacogenetic recommendations for the, for the doctors. It will be built uh, into the national online digital prescription system. And uh, at the same time, we are working on uh, improvements of the algorithm. And also, we are currently in the process of, <coughs> of uh, updating our procedures and, and, and uh, documentation to meet the requirements of uh, regulatory requirements of medical devices and uh, in vitro diagnostics. Um, of course, in science, nothing can be done alone. There is a list of co-authors of this publication, but the team has grown even larger uh, to date, and we have got a lot of positive feedback already, and for me, it's satisfying to see that there's a real opportunity to bring the uh, pharmacogenetic testing into uh, routine uh, clinical care. Thank you. And now, Professor Rubin is not possible to hold this meeting today, but uh, we are recording uh, the presentation. And I ask to the director, is possible to launch the uh, recording, the video recording. Hello, this is uh, Mark Rubin. I'm speaking to you from. Uh, Bern, Switzerland, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to present our work in the development and integration of organoid models in personalized medicine platforms. And uh, we're very grateful to the selection committee for selecting this as one of the uh, projects uh, to receive an award today. So thank you very much. I have the following disclosures. So precision medicine is the context that we developed our platform. And while this is a busy slide, the important point is, is that there are many elements that are important for us to better treat patients in the context of precision medicine. It includes taking care of patients, uh, having genomic data, but also uh, doing research and being able to learn more about the diseases that we're treating. We have uh, prostate cancer organoids, and unfortunately, the, I think the slide hasn't uh, 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 translated well uh, across the internet, but uh, it's, it's supposed to show us a colorful slide of an organoid uh, that, that we grow, and this is from a patient sample, and I'll describe a bit. So first of all, what are organoids and what are the problems with organoids? So organoids are cells that we grow in the la in laboratory. Uh, they're taken from patient samples. And one of the problems with this field has been there's a lack of microenvironment. That is, we don't have the surrounding tissues where the, uh, where the cells normally would grow. We also are selecting a subset of cells, uh, a subset of tumor cells that grow in the, the media that we're developing. And unfortunately, they don't necessarily capture all of the heterogeneity that we see in cancers. Uh, the last component is that they're not easy to maintain and they often die. And so this makes uh, the experience actually quite difficult. And sometimes over time, we also may anticipate seeing what we refer to as a genomic drift or the cells will change over time. And so these are some of the problems. 
To put in perspective uh, how we think organoids work in the context of precision medicine, we have to think about what are the different uh, activities that, that, uh, that they could be useful in. And uh, we compare them with the standard uh, PDX or patient-derived xenograph, which is typically a cells that are collected and grown in mice. And one of the advantages of the organoids is that potentially, uh, if we're trying to do drug screening, we could do this more rapidly with an organoids. They don't take as long to grow. And that would be one of the major advantages of the organoids over time. Uh, we also, over time, could develop stable lines that could be used for a number of activities, including drug development. There have been a number of, of seminal uh, papers in the area of organoid development. Uh, certainly, Hans Claver's group has been one of the main leaders in this activity. And in this example, uh, showing an example of uh, how organoids can be developed uh, predominantly in GI tracked uh, and in both normal and tumors that can be used to model diseases. And here's a, a very exciting example of organoids that can mimic the developmental process. And here you can see the development of a, a mini organoid brain that can be grown. And one can detect a number of things, including signaling and how neurotransmitters work. So it's really a very exciting field in general. When we talk about tumor organoids, we're often talking about tumor cells that are derived from a patient, could be from a biopsy or a small sample. Uh, the tumors grow in a sphere, so in a rounded uh, shape, uh, and they should be sustainable in three dimensions. So they're growing in a ball, but they can also be grown as cell lines, so 2D cultures as well. And they have to grow over more than five passages. In this study that we published in 2017, we described a protocol where we uh, were identifying patients who had advanced cancer, and in parallel, we were performing sequencing of their tumors. We were collecting tumor cells to grow as organoids, and then eventually those organoids would become patient-derived xenografts. And this was in the goal of trying to identify drugs that might be the best drug for that patient after they had failed clinical therapy. And this is an example of what one organoid, this is a sarcoma, a, a soft tissue tumor that's growing. And we can see that they can be maintained. Uh, and the, each of the little dots that you see here represents uh, hundreds, if not thousands, uh, or hundreds of thousands of cells. And here's what they may look under a microscope. And this slide is meant to show you that here's an example of endometrial, pancreatic, col colorectal, and other types of cancers. And that if we look at the patient sample on the top, we can see that they look very similar to the organoids that are grown, uh, as we just shown. And also, when we put them into mice as xenografts, they continue to maintain the same phenotype or the same features. We can also show uh, that over time, if we look at the genomics of these organoids, that over multiple passages in time, we can see that they maintain the same genomic changes. And we can also perform uh, drug screening. And in this paper, we had shown that we could use uh, FDA-approved drugs, but certainly this can be widely expanded. Uh, here's just an example of a high-throughput high drug screen that was performed. And this is a demonstration of some of the types of experiments that can be done where we can uh, look at patient samples here and top a patient with colorectal cancer, on bottom another patient with colorectal cancer, and the difference between those two patients were the types of mutations they had. We can then uh, use a number of drugs. In these examples, we see that some patients are more sensitive to uh, one type of EGFR inhibitor uh, versus another drug. Um, and I think the details aren't as critical as just showing how this works. We can also then take the observations and ask, is this also true? in uh, xenografts, and so we have patient-derived xenografts, and we performed the exact same experiment and found the same result. So both in the organoid and the xenograft, we see the same result. And this would suggest a potential new treatment for this patient. And here's an example of the best combination for this patient, where we looked at two drugs in combination, and a HDAC inhibitor, as well as EGFR inhibitor, were determined to be the best drug for this patient. 
in a study that was performed and published here in Science 2018 by another group, they really demonstrate uh, the vision for where we're going with organoids. And that is that, as I just described, you uh, develop the organoid, you do the drug screening. And in this case, they were able to show that in parallel, if they treated the patient and the, the organoid with the same drugs, that the responses would be very similar. So the idea is that we could use these organoids as avatars to predict how patients would do and also to identify new drugs that patients would benefit from. And this is just an example from University of Bern from uh, Mariana Julio uh, Ducucos uh, group where they're work looking at hepatocellular carcinoma and using organoids for a very similar type of drug screen. So why is this important? Well, some cancers, for example here, prostate cancer, are very poorly represented by uh, typical cell lines. And we hope that with organoids, we're going to be able to increase the number of uh, model systems that we can use. And this is just an example of a study that was published now a number of years ago where we tried to increase the number of organoids. Uh, this is also an active uh, uh, area of research in, at Bern where we're developing new organoids. And here are just some examples um, from Mariana DiGiulio's group in Bern uh, where she's developing organoids from patient samples. It's very challenging. So for some cancer types like prostate cancer, uh, only a small percentage of the cases that we try to grow work. So we have to improve that. And uh, this is obviously very important. And so as we move forward, we have to think about what works and as well as what doesn't work because we have to understand what are the the types of tumors that do not uh, grow well in these conditions. And this is usually unreported, so we think moving forward this is very important to capture. In uh, clinical trials depicted here, we may see that only a subset of individuals may respond. If we had the patient's organoids, which would be a major improvement over cell lines, and here the cell lines we try to show with a lot of background noise, so all sorts of information that occurred over many passages of growing in, in plastic dishes. The organoids hopefully will show a very clear uh, uh, set of alterations. And by using that, hopefully we can mimic patient responses. And here's an example of a published paper where we showed that a drug that uh, was, it was used for a patient who responded here but not here uh, worked very well with the organoid systems. So moving forward, we hope that organoids will be included uh, as we're trying to uh, think about patient treatment, but also in drug development. And the concept would be that we would have a, a biobank full of organoids, and we can conduct a, a trial right now uh, asking, looking at the organoids, which patients or what type of patients would respond. Here's just an example of a refined drug screen. And we would hope that that drug screen would then identify patients who would best respond. So the future for organoids and translational ro roles are limited, are limited are listed here. We think that um, by coming up with rigorous approaches, we'll be able to enable growth that will improve the success and the number of organoids for each patient that we are treating, and that these uh, approaches will allow us to develop uh, new standards for drug testing uh, where we could uh, have trials without uh, patients in the future and uh, make the information widely available to the research community. So I thank you very much for your attention for this short presentation and just would like to acknowledge our funders as well as our, our collaborator, Mariana DiGiulio at the University of Bern. So thank you very much. And then now I ask to the chairman of IC Permed for the as formal ceremony for assigning the this IC Permed recognition. I ask to Patrizio Giacomini to come here. Please say here for the photo, please. Dr. Jürgen Busch. And please. 
and Dr. Sulev Reisberg. And for the official photo. Thanks. In? Inside. What? Yeah. Okay. Please remain seated because we are continuing in one minute. I know scientists. <laughs> So, we have now come to the uh, start of the working groups, and I'm going to be rather short, and then Christina is going to give some logistic, and you go through the working procedures? Yes, okay, good. So, I'm going to be rather short, and just say that uh, the reason that we have this workshop is, of course, to uh, consult experts, researchers, scientists, to the ICPMED and all the member states to know what are really the focus areas for the short term and long term in personalized medicine. There will be a written report put together which, uh, which is uh, produced by the ICPMED, but the importance of that content is of course the next steps. What are the priorities, what are the strategies for member states, but also for IC Permed? And since many of the members of the IC Permed is also members of the ERA Permed, it's also a matter of which kind of funding schemes, what should be the focus areas for the future. So this is a very important thing for IC Permed, because I mean, with the most people sitting on the executive committee are actually not scientists. I have to be honest with that. There are some exceptions, but it is very crucial for us to have this dialogue and discussion with experts, scientists, and to have the outreach and consultation. So that's the reason why we have this workshop. And you have seen that there are, uh, I should say that there are then working groups, so the action item groups of IC Permed have worked together with the host in defining the four areas of interest and what we would like to have answers to some questions. And one is dealing with how to ensure awareness and empowerment for all citizens. The second one is, of course, the one that was, we touched upon earlier today with the GDPR, which is the eth ethical, legal, and social implications, especially uh, across borders. I mean, how can scientists in one area or one geographical location in Europe work with data from another country? And the third one is dealing with uh, the marketing and how to optimize a safe, fast, and economic process to implement personalized medicine approaches. And then we have the big, uh, I wouldn't say it's a bigger challenge, but it is a big challenge. That is actually how to implement personalized medicine in the health care sector, in the health system, and how to ensure sustainability, of course, long term. So, so those are the four topics that we've chosen. Those are the four topics that the IC Permed would like to have your feedback and your input on that we will use in the future for recommendations and for our future efforts. So, Christina? Good morning to everybody. Welcome to the ISTE, and thank you very much for attending the workshop. Uh, I just uh, will introduce you the panels for the wor four working groups that Jan Inbar has mentioned before. In the first working group that will deal with the how to ensure the awareness of and empowerment for all the citizens, uh, our chair is uh, Dr. Sabrina Montante, 
Uh, she has an extensive international experience in public health and research policies and programs. She's responsible at a European level for the public affairs strategy and activities at the, of the National Institute of Health of Italy and of the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart. The vice chair is uh, Marta Puyol, a scholar uh, from the Spanish Association Against Cancer. And she has developed her research career in the oncology field. And now she's the research director of the Scientific Foundation of Spanish Association Against Cancer. And finally, the rapporteur is Dr. Terje Pezzo. She's member of the management board and responsible for the coordination of research and innovation activities in the North Estonian Medical Center in Tallinn. And before, she was the head of sector on e-health and i -N policy in the European Commission's uh, DG Connect. <clears throat> they will uh, develop the three leading questions, uh, the role of health literacy in patient empowerment, transformation of the role of the patient toward the disease through data management, and patient and public engagement with their health services. Uh, for the second work working group, uh, the chair will be Professor Dr. Anne Cambon Thompson. She's a medical doctor specialized in human immunogenetics and health ethics in an epidemiology and public health unit of INSERP and University of Toulouse. Three, uh, she's now Emeritus Research Director at the CNRS. Uh, the vice chair is uh, Professor Dr. Gaetano Guiglielmi. He's Deputy General Director for Health Research and Innovation of the Italian Ministry of Health. And the rapporteur is Professor, professor Dr. Eva Winkler. She's Professor at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Heidelberg, Germany. And she's also Head of the Program for Ethics and pa patient Orient Career in Oncology. I'm sorry. They will uh, be discussing the following leading questions. The handling of incidental additional findings originating from molecular analysis, informing the patient adequately about the tension between data provision and the protection of a person's privacy, and the tension between principles of evidence-based medicine and fast translation. For the third working group, uh, the chair will be Dr. Ana Rita Franco Migliaccio. She's full professor of histology and embryology at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Bologna, Italy. And she has developed her research career in the field of experimental hematology. The vice chair uh, will be Dr. Sebastian Delbruck. He's consultant in the health group of the BDA, BDE, Innovation and, Te and Technique Company from Germany. And finally, the rapporteur is Professor Dr. Jacques de Motz. He's the Director General of ECRAN, the European Clinical Research Infrastructure Network. He's neurologist and professor of cell biology and also acts as advisor at the, uh, to the biology and health research department at the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research. The questions that will be uh, discussed within this working group are uh, technological challenges for personalized medicine research, data generation, and analy analysis, methodological standards for personalized medicine studies, which issues related to market and regulation have to be addressed first in order to facilitate market access of personalized medicine approaches, and entrepreneurial challenges common to all of the previous questions. And the final working group, the fourth one, uh, will be dealing with the personalized medicine in the health systems. Uh, the um, panel is, uh, um, uh, his chair is Professor Dr. Abis Rali, his chief scientist in, of the Israel Ministry of Health, and the head of health policy, health care management, and health economic department. Uh, the vice chair is Dr. Ricardo Pereira, his science officer at the Department for International Relations of the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology where he coordinates the research and innovation agenda on health and clinical and transnational research. 
And finally, the rapporteur is Dr. Tony Andreu. He's the scientific director of EATRIS, the European Infrastructure for Transnational Medicine. He's a medical doctor specialized in genetics and genomics of rare diseases and the field of neuromuscular disorder. And the leading questions that will be uh, discussed within this working group are uh, what institutional design is required to successfully meet the expectations put by the personalized medicine paradigm, what needs to be considered at the patient population level, and how to translate scientific knowledge into patient target interventions. I will only make a summary of the working procedure of the working group so everybody understands how it works. So previously to the second, uh, second IC permit workshop, uh, the panel of each working group uh, has elaborated a document with the three leading questions and the rationale and has been distributed among all the experts uh, after, after its validation by the steering board of IC permit. Uh, so you, you, it's to assure that you will be well prepared for the discussions and you can provide inputs during the discussion. No, uh, you can actively participate in the, in the discussion of the working groups. So uh, after lunch, uh, each working group will have a parallel session uh, where the leading questions uh, presented will be discussed and the panel will lead the discussion. <clears throat> the experts must participate actively, uh, providing inputs. Afterwards, the panel will collect the ideas uh, that have been discussed and will present them in the plenary session that will be uh, af uh, in this afternoon after the working group discussions. Uh, it's, it's the report on intermediate progress of this working group. And these, re these main ideas will be presented by the panels, by the um, chair, by chair, or the rapporteur. Uh, tomorrow, each working group will have another parallel session in the morning, uh, so you can progress to achieve consensus and recommendations. And afterwards, the panel will also present a, a summary of the discussion of the working group and this recommendation achieved in the f a plenary session 4.1, which is the final report of each working group. After the workshop, the panel will elaborate the following documents, a progress consensus report that is a executive summary of the key uh, the leading discussions and other recommendations that have been achieved during the working group discussions, and a final consensus report with uh, an analysis more deeply uh, of these recommendations and the discussions that have been held during the workshop. So thank you very much for your attention. I will uh, say the rooms where the working groups sessions will be held, but nevertheless, the, um, the, there are, I think, some posters to, to lead you. So for the working group uh, one, it will be the room, room one. For working group two, it will be room Joaquin Pereira. For working group three, it will be room Balmis. And for working group four, it will be room Pitaluga. And if you have any doubt about this, you can ask my colleague Candy or me, and we'll lead you.